I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! You're a spaceman, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi everyone, you're watching the Wrestle Rock Podcast Season 5. I'm Johnny D and I am with my partner Benoit, aka Nostradamus Ben. How's he going today, my friend? Fine. And you know what? No. Today we want to rock, baby. Yes, uh, we have uh, a special guest. He is a founding member and guitarist for Twisted Sister. Give it up for GG French. Uh, how's you going today, my friend? Well, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, this is awesome that you accept our uh, invitation for the Wrestle Rock Podcast uh, Season 5. And when we discuss uh, all together in private, we, dis uh, we uh, discover that you are not uh, just um, a guitar player because uh, we know that you have been involved uh, with a couples of uh, wrestling stars in, in the past, you know. And that will be very interesting uh, to talk about, uh, of course, your um, music career. So uh, go ahead with the first question, my friend. Yeah, okay, Mr. French. Uh, you and your brother were raised in Manhattan. What was your childhood in Manhattan? Uh, well, I was born in, in, um, in 1952. Okay. So that makes me um, 71 years old. <clears throat> <laughs> 72 this year as a matter of fact <laughs> crazy um and uh growing up in new york city you know is a very interesting place to grow up especially in manhattan because it is so much the center of so many things and so many cultural things and so many historical things and uh my daughter once said to me my daughter said to me once when she was eight or nine she goes oh new york is so boring <laughs> and I said to her, New York is boring. I said, everybody in the world wants to be here. I said, do you want to be anywhere else? Tell me, you want to be, you want to go to uh, Iowa or Nebraska? Nah. And I said, well, they all want to be here. So if you think this is boring, I got news for you. The rest of the world is going to be really boring because this is a crazy place to grow up in. But I grew up here and when I was um, 10 years old, Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, nine uh, uh, is when I watched the first uh, wrestling show when I was nine. Yeah, years old. yeah, that, 1961. Yes, that's we uh, we we discussed because uh, I remember you saw uh, Buddy uh, you saw Buddy Rogers uh, won the first uh, WWF title in uh, 1962. Uh, you saw uh, Hogan versus uh, the Iron Sheik. Uh, at the Madison Square Garden, uh, and you always uh, and you uh, also sorry uh, saw Mr. USC Tony Atlas and uh, Rocky Johnson uh, make uh, history uh, by uh, becoming the first ever uh, tag team champion, uh, the, the the first ever black tag team champion of all time. So, uh, what is your best memories in uh, in professional wrestling? Uh, well, I would say that the very first time I watched it on television, I was okay. mesmerized. I mean, I was nine years old. My father had been in the army in the 40s and he was a yeah. he had been a boxer and he liked boxing a lot. You know, and okay. I and I um, he always used to tell me about Joe Lewis and, and, and all the famous boxers. OK, but when I saw this wrestling, I said to my father, what's that? Like, what is that? Like, what are they doing? And And I would see. You remember in those days, um, it was kind of the really early days that the WWF was transitioning from the Capitol Wrestling Group. That was Vince McMahon's father, right? Yeah. And the NWA, Vern Gagne. 
I'm, I'm talking for people who are either my age or have read the history of wrestling. We know that um, they, that there was the Midwest wrestling psych circuit. There was the, the Texas wrestling circuit. There was the South wrestling yeah. circuit. And they're all separate. You know, they're all like separate. Yes. It wasn't this big national thing. And everyone kind of just had their own little groupings. So I didn't know that, right? I, I did not know that. All okay. I saw was Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. I saw Anthony Noraka. I saw Argentino Apollo. I saw nice. Haystacks Calhoun. I saw the Kangaroos, the first okay. tag team champions, Wild Red Berry. And, and I said to my dad, I said, wow, this is so cool. It's on every Saturday morning. And my father said to me, well, listen, I got to tell you something. I said, what? He goes, it's, it's all fake. So he said, <laughs> I was nine years old, right? And, and I, what, do you, what do you mean? He says, well, it's all planned out. I said, but they're they're kicking each other's butt up on that. You know, they're getting beat up. He goes, well, they may be getting beat up, but every match has been figured out. Mm -hmm. And I said, who knows that? And he goes, we don't know that. Somebody knows that. It, it and so he's so here's the point. The point of me saying this was that it didn't matter to me. It mm -hmm. did not matter. I had so much fun watching it and guessing who was going to win a match that I started to understand the the pace of the matches, mm -hmm. how a match was choreographed, yeah. and how it was designed to create the audience to be sucked in. And the really good matches really could take you. And, and, and so it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter because, because the end of the day is they, the, the athletes, were unbelievably great, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you could tell. So when people talk about like Jimmy Sn Superfly Snooker, you know, coming off of the rope or yeah. yes. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, you know, those guys. Without Antonio Naraka and Argentino Apollo, you don't have those guys. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like without James Brown, you don't have Michael Jackson. You understand? Yeah. Like, it's because of James Brown, you got Michael Jackson. Well, it's because of Antonio Naraka and because of Argentino Apollo, who most people don't know who these names are, right? Yeah, but right. They were the most acrobatic guys. They of threw themselves in the air. They did flips in the air. They did back somersaults, and mm -hmm. they were beautiful to watch. And I, that has been that stays in my mind a lot. Yeah, and uh, and I say uh, sometimes uh, with people when we discuss about ah uh, professional wrestling is fake. I always said the same thing when you're watching an action uh, movie. My friend, uh, you know what? The the villain it's not uh, a, a really uh, a, a really good villain, you know. And uh, that's all. That's a script. And but you're uh, you're watching the movie, and that's practically the same thing, you know. And uh, that's why we love professional wrestling, you know. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, you lived in uh, Michael Lay's personal house in Dallas, Texas. Can yes. you can you explain your friendship with Michael Lay's and the reason sure. you were ousted by um, uh, Michael sure. Lay? So, so um, from let's say uh, Bruno San Martino won the title from Buddy Rogers in '63 mm -hmm. and and held it for a very long time. I think held it for eight years. That was the longest running champion in the history of the WWF. And, and uh, you know, by 1972, when the band started, we were touring and we were playing all the time. So I didn't get uh, a chance to watch much of it. I, occasionally I would watch, uh, I, I'd catch something on TV. But, but it was kind of like, it wasn't really that big yet. Things hadn't really kind of really gotten big. And then when um, AJ Perro, my drummer, joined Twisted Sister in 82, <laughs> He says to me, my dad used to take me to the garden and see wrestling matches. And I said, you're kidding me. Because the other guys in the band, they're like, you know, I mean, yeah, they, they knew who people were, but we never talked about it. You know, it was a whatever. But AJ <laughs> goes, man, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. I said, OK. So the very first match when AJ just joined the band, the very first match we went to was the match in which Bob Backlund lost to the Iron Sheik. 
and and Arnold mm-hmm. Skolin was his manager. And I do remember Golden Boy Arnold Skolin as a wrestler. You know, he was mm-hmm. a good, he was a baby face. You know, he was yeah. a good guy. So I remember, and, and I hadn't seen, I hadn't heard Skolin's name in a while. So all of a sudden they go, and you know, Bob Blackham's manager is Arnold Skolin. And I, I said to AJ, <laughs> that's, they, I said, that's Golden Boy Arnold Skolin, you know? So, so that was a controversial match because you're not supposed to lose on a DQ. You're not supposed to lose oh, your title okay. on a disqualification. That's supposedly, you, you have to lose it by a pinfall. That's the only way okay. you can lose it. You can't lose it by a DQ. Right. Okay. That's one of the crazy unwritten r- written rules that can be violated at any time they want to violate, them, you know, and change them. So Skolin throws in the towel on Backlund and the Sheik puts the camel clutch on him <laughs> and, and wins the title. And AJ and I are like, you know, we're like kids. We're freaking out. We're like <laughs> we are we're, we're jumping up and down at the garden. You know, I mean, at that time, I was like 31 years old, you know. <laughs> AJ is jumping up and he goes, Fuck it, man. Look at what you see what's going on. <laughs> the so, good old days, you know. This is unbelievable, man. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The iron sheet got him on the camel clutch. So we uh we went home. Oh, I know what it was. They announced that night, they said tickets on sale for the next match a month from now, right? So I said to AJ, let's go down to the ticket box booth now. <laughs> We run downstairs and we get tickets to the next match. We weren't quite sure who was going to be the next match. You I know this is, long, this is a long answer for you, right? <laughs> but I'm going to, but you get, but I need to give you some color to this thing, right? right. So um, we get tickets to the next match. And what was the next match? Hulk Hogan defeating Sheik wow. for the title. Wow. A that piece was, of history. Oh, yeah. Or coming in your... Yeah. 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 That, was the, that was the next month, right? Yeah. So yeah. Me, and, me and AJ are at the garden. <laughs> like, wow. going crazy. Wow. Like, because Hulk Hogan had made his appearance in the Rocky movie. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we knew... We kind of... Hulk Hogan came on the scene really fast. Like, you could really tell that, that Vince McMahon was thinking, if I can get this guy under contract... He's so hot right now. And if I bring him in the ring, because he had no right fighting for the championship, he had no history. You know, it wasn't it yeah, wasn't like I'm totally agree about that. You know, it wasn't like he had five years worth of matches and rematches and almost winning and not winning. He came out of nowhere, like nowhere. You know, they go, ladies and gentlemen, start the Rocky movie. Hulk Hogan comes in the ring <laughs> and he just knocks the sheik out in like a minute, like done. And I looked at AJ and I said, AJ, this is the changing of the guard at the WWF. I said, this is a whole new world. That really was the ushering in of Backlund being out and Hogan coming in changed the entire complexion. Yeah. That's when the golden era started, my friend. Yeah. Right. So, so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right. Uh, MTV discovers it and yeah. everybody like it's rock and wrestling, rock and wrestling, rock and wrestling. Yeah, yeah. So Cindy Lauper's husband, Dave Wolf, her manager. Yeah. Because you were associated yes. with uh, Cindy Lauper yes. and yes. Lou Albano yes. during a yes. MTV so, rock and wrestling yes. era. You know? So what happened was um, he, he contacts my manager okay. and says, JJ French likes wrestling. And they get me on the phone, and Cindy goes, I got a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool with Lou, with Lou Albano. <laughs> We're going to, like, give him a gold record at the Garden, and then he's going to hit David over the head with it, <laughs> and you're going to be there. Okay. Okay? <laughs> so I went, sure. So you have to understand, up until this point, Everything I thought about it was my imagination. I didn't know how the script was written, who wrote the script, who mm-hmm. decided at the last minute. And, you know, when you're that close to it and you're a performer, like I'm in a heavy metal band, you know, people want to mm-hmm. know what goes on behind the scenes for a heavy metal band. I want to know what goes behind the scenes at the wrestling match. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I'm behind the scenes. I'm in the dressing room okay, with Dave Wolf and Lou Albano and I guess one of the script writers for the WWF, mm-hmm. and they're writing the script for how the match is going. And I'm standing there going, oh, crap, man. 
I'm watching this thing. Like, wow. So, <laughs> so, uh, so they, so, you know, a gold record, you know, a gold records in a plaque, you know, it's in a, a frame. Yeah. So a, a real gold record has, has some weight, has some weight to it. Like the frame is heavy. If you hit somebody over the head with that, it's going to hurt. Like really going to hurt. Probably. So, so Cindy, I said to Cindy something like, Lou is going to hit Dave over the head. She goes, yeah, but it's going to be like a, it's going to be made out of balsa wood, not real wood. So they make this fake gold record okay, with like the thinnest paper and balsa wood. The thing weighed about two ounces. You okay. could not kill a cockroach with this thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So in the script. And they're writing the script down. They're writing the script. In the script, um, Cindy is going to thank Lou for being her father in the video. Okay. Girls oh, yeah. I, fun, that, right? I remember that. And then awesome. Lou is going to turn around and have an argument with Dave Wolf and smash him over the head with a gold record. <laughs> right? So they're writing the script. That was awesome. I'm, like, I'm going, wow, man, this is so freaking cool. Like, this is cool. I'm going to be in the ring. Like, at my ass is going hard. Well, this bullshit is going on. Like, I can curse, right? I want to, can you curse? Can you use bad language on this? Okay, cursing. Yes. Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Anyway, so, yes. so, so they do the whole thing. And Lou Albano comes out and Cindy gives him the gold record. And he turns around and he smashes Dave Wolf over. And Dave goes into convulsions, like <laughs> convulsions. And they and they bring an ambulance in. Oh, with paramedics. Okay. And I, I didn't I didn't know this part okay. was happening. I didn't okay. know this was happening. So they bring these guys up. Yeah, you know, these these guys dressed up in hospital garb with a with a stretcher, and they okay. put a neck brace on Dave. And they put Dave on the stretcher, and and they're supposed to take him to the hospital. So meanwhile, the cameras are following us, you know, all the way down, off the ring, outside into the dressing room area. And Cindy is holding Dave's hand. You're gonna be all right. You're gonna be okay. Be okay. <laughs> He's like, I can't walk. I can't walk. And and uh, and so they said to me, JJ, hold Dave's hand. Hold Dave's hand. Like so, there in the WWF magazine that month there was a WWF magazine. Okay. See, there's a photo of me in the really? in the ambulance. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Dave Wolf's hand, you know, saying, "Dave, you'll be okay, man. You'll be okay. You'll be fine." You know. So I thought that was, I thought that was just really cool. You know, that was just really really cool. So let's move. So let's now go into all the wrestling fans that were part of the music business who never really talked about it much now because it's MTV, yeah. everyone's coming out of the woodwork, you know, like, Oh, mm -hmm. are you kidding, man? I've been watching this since I was a kid, you know, like all these guys, promotion guys, radio promotion guys, musicians, everyone's saying, I've been watching this you know, for, you know, for years. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest, most influential radio programmers was named Tommy Nast. N-A-S-T, Tommy Nast. Okay. In fact, I spoke to him yesterday for the first time in, God knows, about 10 years. Because I told him I was going to be on your show. And I said to Tommy, I got to tell the story about Tommy Nast. So Tommy, Tommy was the, owned a, a radio promotion magazine called Album Network, which was very influential in my business. Okay. When the songs were going up the charts in the radio stations. We all watch it. So Tommy published that magazine. And Tommy says to me, I'm good friends with uh, the Freebirds, Michael Hayes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm really good friends with Michael Hayes. And Michael Hayes, he wants to be in a rock band. He's got a rock band. Because, oh, oh. because, oh, every, because everybody, every athlete wants to be a musician, and every musician wants to be an athlete. Okay? Okay. So, Tom, so, so, so Michael Hayes wants to be a, a rock star. Okay. So Tommy says, um, you got to meet Michael and help write songs for his next album. <laughs> so I said, sure, you know, so I start, so I start talking to Michael Hayes, right. Okay. And, um, on the phone and he says, and then he sends me all these videotapes of him and the Von Erics. See at that point, the Von Erics had not come to New York city and they had not made it onto national television because Texas championship wrestling 
was just in Texas. Okay. Okay. Right. And it's like, um, uh, it's it like, was a territory. It, it, it was, was a very, territory. very territorial. Yeah. So, okay, so, like, so let's say all of the wrestlers that were involved uh, uh, with Ted Turner owned um, WC. It was WCW. Yeah. Yeah. About so, Jim Crockett promotions. Yes. Yeah, Jim Crockett. But right. So you yeah. had you had uh, you had all those guys like Sting. We didn't we didn't know who Sting mm -hmm. was. We didn't know the Von Erichs. We didn't know um, Rock and Roll Express. You know those guys, Ricky and his partner, yeah. the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express. All those all those guys existed, but we didn't know about them all that much, right? Because yeah. they, they were kept regionally. So Michael goes, yeah, man, the Von Erichs, they rule, man. They're fucking the like, <laughs> biggest thing. And we beat them. And he sends me a videotape of the Freebirds defeating the Von Erichs <clears throat> in a match at Texas Stadium. Sold out. 50,000 wow. people. Like, and, I, and I'm sitting there at my home in Manhattan watching this videotape. And there's Michael and Bam Bam Gordy and Buddy Roberts, right? <laughs> And, it's been a while. And, and <laughs> you know, and you're watching the whole crowd go absolutely apeshit crazy. And, and Michael goes, you know, we got another match coming up pretty soon. And why don't you come down, stay with me. We'll write some <laughs> songs and then you come to the match. So I went, okay. So uh, I go down to Texas mm -hmm. and I live with Michael for a week. And wow. um, we played... We played music. Okay. And and then he took me to Texas Stadium. And it was the big rematch. And it was uh, two rings, two gigantic wrestling rings tied together. Okay. okay. At that point, David Von Erich had died. Right? So it was Kerry. Okay. Kevin. And... The, the younger, the younger, younger the, the younger brother, uh, the younger brother. Uh, Mike, Mike Von Eric, Mike, Mike, was Mike. it? Mike, Mike Von Eric, Mike Von Eric. My memory is good. So three of them. The David had had suffered an injury in yeah. Tokyo and died. Yeah. So it was the three of them versus the three. Uh, so so the whole time with Michael, I, I'm saying to Michael, so what's going to happen in the match? Mm -hmm. And he goes, I, I, he goes, what do you mean? I said, come on, Michael. I said, come on, you come on. Just, just tell me. He goes, I can't. We can't. Like it's like it's like being in the mafia. We cannot <laughs> we cannot divulge anything. Now, let me tell you this. I went out with those guys every night because I was hanging out with all of these wrestlers, all these mm -hmm. guys they knew. And you know, they would go to strip clubs all the time. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what they would do. And they would get drunk. They drank a lot. But I don't drink. Okay. Okay. So, and I don't do drugs. So, <laughs> because I don't drink and do drugs, I'm not the greatest guy to hang out with if you like to drink and do drugs because it's boring for me. Oh, and, okay. and I told Michael, I said, you know, I'll drink a Coke, I'll drink some, you know, soda. That's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, let me be clear. I'm not passing judgment. You do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I, I don't yeah. care. It's just for me. Probably. I don't do it. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> So um, I'm hanging out with, you know, Big John Studd and all these guys, and they're all really nice guys. But when they get drunk and hammered, man, it's like it's like when a rock star gets drunk and hammered, they weigh 98 pounds. And mm -hmm. you can just like, you know, you can throw them in the bed. But when these dudes weigh 450 pounds get hammered, that's a whole other. Yeah, that's a whole other story, you know, and uh, and it can get crazy. And so I would sit with these guys and we would talk about my history in wrestling and they were all respectful, you know, that I knew it. Yeah. They, they, you know, they actually appreciated the fact that I could, you know, talk, I could talk it because I knew it going back. Mm -hmm. But when it came time to like me going, so come on, tell me the story. It's like the mafia, a wall. <laughs> yeah. We don't violate this. Is which is cool. Is. Listen, I actually respected that. I actually really kind of respected it. I said, okay, that's the oath they take. It's like you don't ever say in the mafia, I'm in the mafia. You know, you don't go, I'm a made guy. You don't walk up to somebody mm -hmm. and tell them that. You don't tell somebody. So these guys aren't going to divulge, no matter how hammered they got. 
as they wouldn't divulge anything. So they wouldn't <laughs> tell me what would happen. All Michael said was, I want you sitting ringside, okay? <laughs> you just sit ringside. So I sat ringside for the match, and it was sold out. And it was insane. However, I will say that sitting that close isn't the best thing to do if you're a fan because a lot of times when they're punching someone they're not even hitting them mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. like they're not even hitting them and they're making the noise by slapping the chest and hitting the ring mm -hmm. and even though i know it and even though that with all my respect for them as yeah. as, as a stuntman um i still want to be entertained and so i tell people when they go to these matches sit back a bit you know yeah like sit back because you want to you, you, you want to be, you know, fooled. I mean, you really want to be fooled. Again, I am, I'm being really clear about this. These guys get their asses kicked. They are stuntmen. They're the best stuntmen. But when you're that close and you see them miss, they're not even hitting, like in some of the, and so that kind of was weird to me. You know, like being that, and Michael kept insisting, get close, get close, get close, get close. And I got close and I said, you know what? I think I'd rather sit, 20 rows back yeah for you understand I hope that, you, that's I hope totally you. different because when you're closer you know you can smell you can just uh smell the the, the, the sensitive the movement that's what the 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 I always said that the, 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 the emotion is very different the feeling because, you know, the feeling yeah. is very different than if you are on uh uh, ten, uh, ten row uh, behind. So you know. Ah, Tommy. Oh, Tommy, uh, your your microphone is uh, on mute. Uh, oh, that's weird. Is that better? Okay. Oh it, yeah, of it's, course. It's perfect. It went by itself. I don't know what happened. No, no problem. No problem. Okay. And we would like to discuss about uh, your uh, rock music. Uh, your rock uh, history, of course. Uh, you auditioned in uh, 1972 for the first uh, version of uh, Wicked Lester with Gene and Paul Stanley. And we're supposed to be the, 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 the spaceman uh, instead of Ace Frehley. Can you share uh, with us more details about that? Uh, yeah, it's been written about a lot. And I don't ever want to overstate what it was. Uh, they auditioned many people. Okay. I was one. Yeah, I remember and, that. And that was it. You know? Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I got an audition because I knew somebody who knew the producer of Wicked Lester, and he got me an audition, and I <laughs> played with him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then they never returned my call. So, I mean, okay. that happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like Ace replaced me. I have no idea how many people auditioned. Okay, oh, okay, 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 okay. Because I met them in no problem. Okay. I met them in June and they selected Ace in September. They were still running, they were still advertising for guitar players in the local paper mm -hmm. in September. Okay. And I did not know I answered that phone call because I just thought it was another band looking for somebody else, and it was Gene. And his number, they were still in the paper advertising. Uh, in the local uh, village voice, I think, and he just said, "Oh, we got a guy. We just, we just got a guy. His name is uh, Paul Fraley." That's what he said oh. to me. Okay, his name is Paul. We just, we just hired him, and I went, "Oh, okay." So that was three months later. So I'm, a, and I, and during that three months, I was in another band. Okay, okay, that's that's I, why. Yeah, I joined another band, okay. and we spent the whole summer rehearsing. Okay. Uh, in a in a hippie commune in Pennsylvania, and then we played a show, and that was it. So, okay. so sometime in September or October, um, Gene said, or he called me, or I called him, or something, and he said, "You should come mm -hmm. down and um, and hear the new band, hear what okay. hear hear what we were trying to explain. They were trying to explain to me when they met me that they were changing from from this band that was Wicked Lester." Mm -hmm. to kiss yeah, yeah and wicked lester was very much a um like a 70s sounding rock group like like uh 
like the band that did Brandy, you're a fine girl, you're what a good life, you could be looking glass. Like they were like that. And they said to me, they said, we're, we're getting, we're changing. We're not going to be like that. We're going to be like uh, English bands like Slade. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned Slade. And they the original come on, feel the noise, Slade. No, well, um, that was a uh, yes, oh, sorry, original, yes, yeah. feel, yes, exactly. Okay. So they said they said we're going to wear platform shoes. And remember, nobody was doing that yet, you know. So we're going to wear platform shoes, and we're going to sound English. They were obsessed with Englishness, you know. So Gene says, "I'm changing my name to to Gene Simmons from Gene Klein," and and Stan it was Stanley Eisen when I met him, mm -hmm. and he said, "I'm going to call myself Paul Stanley." These are very anglicized names. My name was John Segal, and Gene said to me, "That's a very Jewish name." Now he has a Jewish name. No one ever said to me, "You have a Jewish name before," mm -hmm. and especially another Jew telling a Jew he had a Jewish name. I mean, I'm aware that it's I'm Jewish, but no one ever made a point of it. Especially another Jew telling me, and he says to me, "I look too Jewish with with my eyeglasses on," which was a little weird. I thought that was like, who cares? Like, okay, but frankly, I have to tell you a couple of things. One. When I saw Kiss as Kiss in the loft for the first time, rehearsing, changing over from Wicked Lester to Kiss, mm -hmm. they were playing Marshall amplifiers. And um, American bands back in those days did not play Marshalls. Uh, the English bands all did. But the American bands are still playing Fenders and Trainers and mm -hmm. a, a Canadian company, yeah. um, uh, Ampegs. But they weren't playing Marshalls yet. Jimi Hendrix was, but that was it. Mm -hmm. Well, they had martial amplifiers. Like they were making a statement when they when they played for me in the loft that afternoon. The statement they made by how they looked and sounded was very much a clear, focused image change. Like you could tell something was going on here. And I walked uh -huh. out. Remember, in those days, the New York Dolls were popular. And the dolls used to play at the Mercer Arts Center. And so on the very same days, you'd go see the dolls. You could, you know, I went to the Kiss mm -hmm. rehearsal. And the difference between the bands was gigantic. The dolls were, they were trying to be like the Rolling Stones. You know, they were trying to give you that Rolling Stones sloppy kind of rock and rolly faces kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But Kiss was like, like regimented. Like you could just tell. Mm -hmm like Slade or or Sweet, like Regiment or Bowie, you know, the Spiders from Mars, really good players, very focused on an image. And I walked out very impressed by it, that. And I thought to myself, that's the kind of band I want to put together, focused like that. And that's when the idea changed my name to create an image with my sunglasses and my name change. And so that was all part of the catalyst of KISS. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what it was. So I was never in KISS. I was one of many people that, that probably auditioned for them. And I will tell you that Ace was the right guy in the right band at the right time. And he, I think Ace is like the American Keith Richards. I just think he is, you know, if you ask me the most influential guitar players in rock and roll, mm -hmm. I would say yeah. Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, and, and Ace Freely. And somebody would say, well, Ace isn't as good as Jimi Hendrix. He's not as good as... As uh, as Eddie Van Halen, I said that's not the point. He embodies what a rock star should look and look like and yeah. be like. The way Keith is not Eric Clapton, you know, mm -hmm. Keith is not, you know, he's not he's not those guys. He's just mm -hmm. rock and roll. Yeah, he's yeah, rock. yeah. He's got the vibe. He is Ace, a rock and roll. That vibe. Ace is probably responsible for more kids wanting to be rock stars than any other guitar player. You know, for all the thousands of people they played for. Yeah, over the years, yeah. the, the arenas. So mm -hmm. I give him, I, I say the nicest things about him. I happen to think that he deserves that. You know, that's what he did. So I, I you know, I put aside all the other criti critical comments one makes about it. He embodies what rock stardom was to a certain group of people. So that was the story with Kiss. Can I, I just, did. can I just finish, by the way? Yes. Let me just finish the Texas thing. Let me just finish it. Yes, go oh, on. Oh, yeah, go yeah, on. yeah, of course. So, so the Von Erichs beat. The Freebirds, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the Freebirds knew that was going to happen. How did I realize I knew it was going to happen? Because at the end of the match, the most valuable wrestler was given a brand new Cadillac or Lincoln okay. Continental car, and they drove it out to the field, right? Okay. They drove it out to the field. Okay. And as they drove it out to the field, all of a sudden, 
the Freebirds went under the under the ring, pulled out chains, <laughs> ran and smashed the cart to smithereens, which means it was all set up. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it was all set up. Like, of course, it had to be set up. Why would they have weapons to destroy a car hidden under the stage? Right. So wow. at the end of the match. I remember going back to the house and I said to Michael, God, that was amazing. He goes, yeah, wasn't that incredible? Like he wasn't saying, oh, we lost the match. It's terrible. He was like, we put on a show. So, yeah. 50,000 people lost their yeah. freaking minds. They and lost we were the, the, the match of the night. So we don't care the rest. You know? Exactly. <laughs> It's exactly right. So, yeah. so, so then a year later, um, a year later, they all came to New York City. Okay. And 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 Vern Gagne mm -hmm. from the AWA. Yeah. Minneapolis. Right. He brought in all these wrestlers from the Midwest and the and the South. Mm -hmm. The Von Erichs, the Freebirds, Big John stuff, like all these guys, the Samoans <laughs> all came in and they all they all had a gigantic wrestling match at at uh, the Meadowlands Arena, which is in New Jersey. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Michael calls me and he goes, JJ, welcome <laughs> to the Meadowlands. And uh, since that's your area, we want you to uh, host a party. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I go, where? And he goes, Studio 54. <laughs> and I said, wow, it's, I didn't even know Studio 54 reopened. It closed, you know, for a while. Well, it reopened. And um, they got like five limousines. And at the end of the match, the end of the night, we stuffed everybody in limousines and we brought them into the city. To party at studio 54 and you know i'm you know like these guys are big dudes you know these are big i'm a big guy i'm six two and i'm not like six eight you know and there's the samoans and terry Cordy and bam bam big john stud <laughs> michael Hayes, and they're trying to pick up girls at the bar <laughs> i was like uh it was kind of it was really cool i had a great time i had a really 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 good time with those guys okay uh, in 2008 Sorry, in 2006, you visited Quebec City for our summer fest called, in French, Festival d'été de Québec, with the Ben Scorpions. Did you enjoy your time in Quebec City? Um, are you talking about the show in, in um, the show yeah. with the Scorpions we did in? Yes, it, it, years was, ago. it was 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years, years ago. Yeah, yeah, in Quebec, in Quebec yeah. right? Yes, of course. Well, that was a great show. Were you guys at the show? Yeah, that was my first uh, show ever, uh, music show ever. And I really? remember, yeah. Okay. And that was just fantastic for sure. I think so. And when you were two of the greatest uh, music bands of all time, uh, that's a piece of history for Quebec City. Uh, and after this uh, edition of uh, Festival de Québec, uh, there was a big uh, uh, growing up uh, for the the the, the festival d'été, and after that we received a lot of uh, bands uh, like uh, Foo Fighters, uh, uh, Imagine Dragons, Stone, Imagine Dragons, and uh, you are a piece of history, you know. Ah, yes. You have a uh, once again a, a, a problem with your, you with your mic. Yes. How's that? No yeah, problem. That's good. Okay. good. So, um, our album "Stay Hungry" because much music, love, twisted sister, played the hell out of our videos, played our records, and our record sales in Canada were way higher than any other American band's proportional record sales in Canada. So the way it works is in America, if you sell a million records, you sell 100,000 in Canada. If you sell mm -hmm. 2 million records, you sell 200,000 in Canada. Okay. Well, we sold 2 million records and sold 600,000 in Canada. You wow. know, we toured with Iron Maiden and people know um, everyone has a copy of Stay Hungry. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a copy of it. So when we came back and did the show with Scorpions, Yep. I don't think Scorpions knew how popular Twisted Sister really was. And I think you would agree our show is pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Pretty unbelievable, wasn't it? Totally awesome for sure. And I I have the great memories about my my evening. Yeah. It was just insane. So the next day in the big Quebec newspaper, 
So the Scorpions were headliners, right? It said yeah. Scorpions and Twisted Sister, right? That was the way yeah. it was built. In the newspaper, the front page. Yeah. The front page was it's you. Said, yeah, I remember. Twister and Scorpions yeah. in small letters. And yeah, it had yeah. a kid dressed as D. Yeah, D cover. and uh, all the bands. I and remember then that. opened up the page and was all Twisted Sister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how Scorpions feels about that. Like... Um, it was it was it was monumental, yeah, you know. And yeah. Th then we did Metal Montreal seven years ago okay. with uh, Slayer and Metallica. Wow. Um, and uh, Slayer was one night, Metallica was another night. We flew in from Spain to do that show, mm -hmm. and the promoter put us on at four o'clock in the afternoon. Normally we go on at night, and we said, you know, fine, we'll do what we have to do, and we did it, and we got the most reviews. The best reviews. We have films of it. I have films of 80,000 people singing, we're not going to take it, and I want to rock, and we blew the place apart. So we have a huge affection for Canada, a giant mm -hmm. affection for Canada. You know, absolutely love it. The fans have been, the fans are great up there, and they have a great memory, and we have such an affection for, for what we've done and accomplished and how they feel about us. Yeah, last year in uh, 2023, Twisted Sister was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What was your reaction when you found out this news? So that was the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. Yeah. So we were inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame in 2003. And, oh, 2003. Uh, 2003. Oh, that, that, uh, it's my bad. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, 2003. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's okay. But no, 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 no. You got your name, numbers right. Okay, we got inducted the Long Island Music Hall of Fame 2003, and last year, 2023, we were inducted into the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay, okay, okay. So that is correct. Okay. And it's always an honor to be inducted into these things because, mm -hmm. you know, you work hard all your life to, to, meet, to matter, you know, to be important to people, to make a difference. Yeah. And there's, how do you know you made a difference? Well, you can look at your record sales. You know, you could look at your tour history, and then you could look at your legacy. And if your legacy means that people who vote for these things um, think enough of you to want to memorialize you mm -hmm. in such a way that recognizes your excellence, yeah. then you, uh, you, you're honored by it. So the Long Island Music Hall of Fame opened in 2003. The first, the first people put into that Hall of Fame was Twisted Sister... And Billy Joel, um, I, I think Joan Jett, we were the first first people to enter that Hall of Fame. And the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame is newer, um, but when we were told that they were honoring us, you know, here we are with ACDC, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the most famous, you know, Metallica. These are the most famous names in metal. And to work as hard as we worked for all the years we put in, because the bands, you know, started 50 years ago, so to be recognized is uh, is is an honor, and that's uh, that's a legacy. But you know what's even a crazier, bigger legacy? We're not going to take it, and I want to rock. Those two songs are the most licensed songs in the history of heavy metal for 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 TV shows, commercials, video games, soundtracks, movies. So bigger than anybody, and and that's a real honor because. Because those songs will live forever. We're not going to take it as a worldwide anthem. And it's it's one of the biggest in the world. And we're honored that that, has, that, that legacy lasts. And here we are. Look, think of, think of this. In 1973, Judas Priest, Aerosmith, Kiss, ACDC, and Twisted Sister all started in 1973. Yeah. That's 51 years ago, right? Yeah. If you asked us 51 years ago how long we would last as a band, we all would have said That's five insane. years, maybe five years, maybe yeah. 10, maybe 10, maybe mm -hmm. 10, maybe. Here we are 51 years later. Kiss, ACDC, Aerosmith, Judas Priest, Twisted Sister, still making a difference. It's incredible. <coughs> Excuse me. And they still there. That was very yeah. rare because, oh man, that that that's insane, you yeah. know. Uh, 
45 minutes interview. already yes five 45 minutes interview uh thank you so much uh, for your time uh for ending as usual uh, my partner benoit aka uh, nostradamus ben it's all about the french prophet and he will try to predict uh, the, future the future of our guests okay well, first of all mr french uh, thank you so much for the interview and i predict uh, that uh, a movie about uh, Twisted Sister will release in, in a few years. <laughs> well, that's great. By the way, I have a book called Twisted, yeah, Bus Twisted yeah, Business. Sir. You can get that on Amazon. Yes. And sir. I have a, I have a podcast. I have a yeah. podcast, uh, which is called The JJ French Connection. Yeah, um, yeah. This week, I have Tommy Emmanuel. I've had Joe Bonamassa. I've had Steve Vai. I've had some of the greatest musicians, actors, authors, all different kinds of people on my podcast. It's the JJ French Connection, J-A-Y-J-A-Y-F-R-E-N-C-H, the JJ French Connection on Spotify. You can get my podcast. And also, I do now motivational speaking for yeah. all sorts of groups. And if you want to reach me, if you want to book me for that, it's very simple. I'm going to give you an email address. You can email me um, with this address and contact me about, about that or any other question you have about Twisted Sister. It's ask. JJ, that's ask, the word ask, like A S K, yeah. ask JJ, J A Y, J A Y, ask JJTS, as in Twisted Sister, or Taylor Swift, or Times Square. Okay, ask <laughs> JJTS at gmail.com. And you can book me for motivational speaking or anything else you may want to reach me for. So, guys, thank you for having me on. And oh, I'm, oh, I'm so happy to reminisce about my wrestling history because I don't get a chance to tell too many people my wrestling. Oh, that's awesome that you can uh, accept uh, this invitation. And we discover a lot of uh, interesting story and uh, the, the, the behind the scene of uh, Gigi French, founding member and guitarist for uh, Twisted Sister. Thank you so much, Mr. French. Goodbye. And uh, take care, my friend. Thank you, guys.